Today, I'm going to connect the dots from the collective grief of post 9-11 to the even more personal grief of the death of close family members to an album that very nearly found its way into the trash. Our story begins in the depths of a Montreal winter as death and birth collided. It is here a group of musicians created an album that would redefine indie rock. Welcome to Poetic Wax. I'm Andy Fenstermaker, and I love digging into the history of bands, albums, and songs in the record collection I started back in the 1990s. Today, we're dropping the needle on a record that emerged from tragedy to become a triumph. Arcade Fire's Funeral. It's an album that was born from personal loss, and it was almost scrapped entirely. We'll get to that revelation later, but first, let's set the scene. It's 2003, and members of Arcade Fire are grappling with a series of family deaths, while simultaneously welcoming new life into the world. In a small apartment in Montreal's Mile End neighborhood, surrounded by thrift store instruments and vintage recording gear, they're about to channel their raw emotions into a debut album that would shake the foundations of indie music. As I pull Funeral from its sleeve, feeling the weight of its cultural impact, I'm reminded of why I and why we collect these musical time capsules. Each spin of Funeral is a journey back to a moment when grief and hope collided to create something extraordinary. This is an album that is one of the most listened to in my collection. It's one of the most listened to albums of 2024 for me personally. It's time to explore the beautiful, haunting world of Arcade Fire's Funeral, a record that proves that sometimes the most profound art comes from our darkest moments. Chapter 1, The Losses That Inspired Funeral by Arcade Fire. As the haunting piano of neighborhood number one, Tunnels, fills the room, let's rewind to the origins of Arcade Fire and the tumultuous period that birthed Funeral. The band's core formed around the husband and wife duo of Wynne Butler and Regine Chisange. When they met in 2000, their musical connection was immediate and electric. Richard Reed Perry and Wynne's brother, William, soon joined, creating the nucleus of what would become Arcade Fire. But as the band was coming together, tragedy was weaving its way through their lives. In the span of three years leading up to and during the recording of Funeral, the band members lost numerous family members. Wynne and Will's grandfather, Alvino Ray, a jazz musician who deeply influenced them, passed away. Regine, who had already lost her mother as a child, suffered the death of her grandmother. Richard Perry lost his aunt. It was a period of profound loss that cast a long shadow over the band. And the album's title, Funeral, was a direct response to this series of tragedies. Yet, in the midst of this grief, there was also new life. As the band grappled with loss, they also celebrated marriages and the birth of a child. This juxtaposition of death and life, endings and beginnings, permeates every moment on this record. The songs on Funeral weren't just written, they were excavated from the depths of the band's collective emotional experience. Wake Up, with its anthemic calls to action, was born from Wynne Butler's feelings of lost innocence. Neighborhood number one, Tunnels, imagines a world where young lovers dig tunnels to each other's houses, to escape the adult world. Haiti, co-written by Regine, touches on her family's history and the political turmoil of her parents' homeland. Each song on this album is a tapestry of personal history, collective grief, and defiant hope, turning their pain into art. As we listen to the swelling orchestration of Crown of Love, it's hard to believe that this lush, intricate music was created by a group of young, grieving artists in small apartments and rural homes. But perhaps it was precisely this rawness, this proximity to profound emotions, that gave Funeral its undeniable power. Chapter 2, Why Arcade Fire Almost Put Funeral to Rest Before we dig into the story behind Arcade Fire almost burying Funeral altogether, I want to take a moment to say that, like your favorite albums, creating content is far from easy. A lot goes into it. So please, like, subscribe, rate, and review, and comment, and share this video and episode with a fellow music lover. I'd appreciate the support. 
Now let's address the bombshell I teased earlier. Funeral almost never saw the light of day. As the band was deep in recording, a crisis of confidence nearly derailed the entire project. Picture this, it's 2003, Arcade Fire is working timelessly on their debut album, but doubt begins to creep in. Wynn Butler, in particular, starts to question everything. The pressure of creating something meaningful in the wake of so much personal loss becomes a bit overwhelming. There's a moment, a pivotal, heart-stopping moment, where Butler seriously considers scrapping the entire album. Why? Because he felt it wasn't good enough. The weight of their collective grief, combined with the ambition to create something truly extraordinary, almost crushed the project entirely. Butler later recalled thinking, quote, This isn't the album. We can do better. It was a knife's edge decision. Had Butler's doubts won out, we might never have heard Rebellion lies or in the back seat. Thankfully, the band persevered, encouraged by early positive reactions from friends and family. With renewed determination, Arcade Fire entered studio in Montreal to finish what they'd started. This became the crucible where Funeral would be forged into its final form. The recording process was as unconventional as the band itself. They used natural reverb to create the album's distinctive sound. Vintage gear and unusual instruments were employed to craft the rich, layered soundscapes we hear on tracks throughout the album. The band members switched instruments frequently, contributing to the album's eclectic sound. Regine might be on drums on one track, accordion on next, and vocals after that. This musical chair approach added depth and variety to the recordings. Producer Howard Billerman, who also played on drums on the album, helped capture the raw energy of the band's live performances. He understood that the power of Arcade Fire lay not just in the songs themselves, but in the passionate, almost feverish way they were performed. Listen to the crescendo in Neighborhood Number 3, Power Out, and you can almost feel the electricity in each cymbal crash, each strum of the guitar, each impassioned vocal from tragedy to near failure to the cusp of indie rock history. Chapter 3 the legacy of Arcade Fire's funeral. As the final notes of In the Back Seat fade out, let's reflect just a little bit on the monumental impact Funeral had on the music world. Upon its release in September 2004, Funeral didn't just arrive, it kind of exploded onto the scene. Critics were unanimous in their praise, with many hailing it as an instant classic. Pitchfork awarded it a near perfect 9.7 out of 10, eventually crowning it the best album of the 2000s. Rolling Stone placed it at number 500 on its 2020 list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. But Funeral wasn't just a critical darling. It resonated deeply with listeners. The album's themes of loss, love, and resilience struck chords with a generation grappling with post-9-11 anxiety and the search for authentic expression in an increasingly digital world. Commercially, Funeral was a slow-burning success. It didn't top the charts immediately, but gained momentum through word of mouth and live performances. The album has since been certified platinum in the UK, Canada, and gold in the United States. Funeral didn't just launch Arcade Fire's career, it helped redefine indie rock. The album's ambitious arrangements, emotional intensity, and seamless blend of rock, folk, art pop, all these influences paved the way for a new wave of indie bands unafraid to think big. Songs like Wake Up have transcended the album, becoming cultural touchstones used in films and TV shows. The track's uplifting chorus has rallied crowds at concerts and protests alike. Perhaps most importantly, though, Funeral proved that deeply personal, creatively ambitious music could find a wide audience. It showed that an independent band could achieve mass success without compromising their artistic vision. Each spin of Funeral is not just a listen. It's a connection to the moment when a group of grief-stricken young musicians poured their hearts into their art and changed the course of indie music history. That grief is relatable, and the anthems tucked onto this record show that we can overcome grief and see light even in the darkest of times. 
Arcade Fire would go on to release more critically acclaimed albums, headline major festivals, and win numerous awards, including an Album of the Year Grammy for the Suburbs. In fact, I feel their album We from 2022 is vastly underappreciated in the post-pandemic world of albums that really, really resonate with our collective suffering during that era. But Funeral remains their raw, beating heart, a testament to the power of turning pain into beauty. So next time you're flipping through the A section at a record store, pick up a copy of Funeral if you haven't already. It's not just an album. It's a cultural artifact, a time capsule of emotion and reminder that sometimes the most profound art comes from our darkest moments. Chapter 4, Revisiting Indie Rock in the Early to Mid-2000s. The early 2000s marked a significant turning point for indie music, with several bands breaking through to mainstream success while maintaining their artistic integrity. This period saw indie rock evolve from a niche genre to a cultural force influencing fashion and film soundtracks and mainstream pop music. Arcade Fire's Funeral wasn't the only landmark album of this era, nor was it the only album that birthed from tragedy and hard times. And that all just in 2004. Modest Mouse, a band that had been building a cult following since the mid-1990s, released good news for people who have bad news that same year. The album's lead single, Float On, became an unlikely hit, an anthem of perseverance. Perhaps the best anthem of perseverance of all time. And that propelled Modest Mouse to commercial success without compromising their indie credibility. Meanwhile, Blonde Redhead was going through a transformative period of their own. In 2002, lead singer Kazu Makino suffered a serious horse riding accident that very nearly ended her music career. This traumatic event profoundly influenced their 2004 album Misery is a Butterfly, resulting in a more introspective and atmospheric sound as they leaned more into shoegaze and dream pop influences. These stories of perseverance and artistic evolution mirror Arcade Fire's journey and exemplify the spirit of indie music during this pivotal time. I've covered both of these records here on Poetic Wax, and you definitely want to dig those stories next. I'm Andy. This has been another episode of Poetic Wax. Again, episodes drop on YouTube every Sunday. You can find them on Spotify and Apple Music and other podcast platforms every Monday. And on Tuesday, the written form drops on my Substack with other visual and audio that you can listen to. I'll see you in the next video.